Zhang Hu, written on the Jingling Ferry Crossing. At Jingling, there is a small inn by the ferry dock. A traveller spends the night there, full of sadness. When the tide turns under a setting moon, in the distance, two or three lights flicker at Guajou. So, after a long hiatus, we continue with this series of uh, poems from the 300 Tang Poems series. This is the fourth and last poem of Zhang Hu in this section of heptasyllabic quatrains. And as you have already noticed from my reading it, this is a pretty conventional poem on the topic of um, traveling. Um, you will remember that we've encountered lots of poems in which the poet depicts a scene in which he stops at some place. It can be an inn, it can be a tower or a pavilion, it can be a meandering in the river, uh, it can be whether the poet stays in a boat in which he's traveling down the river, or whether he goes mm, into the town. But this is a pretty, pretty common topic in scholar official poetry. The poet, the poetic persona, is traveling, it's some, and is traveling somewhere. And uh, ferry crossing is also very typical. Uh, so we might imagine as a background to this poem that the poetic persona of Zhang Hu has reached Jingling, uh, ferry crossing probably at night or, 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 or when night was setting in and when no more ferry crossings were taking place he had to take refuge in an inn that was conveniently located next to the uh, ferry crossing and he's spending this night wakeful at night without sleeping uh, remember a traveler uh, is always meant to be a sad person in, in the conventions of Chinese scholarly official poetry traveling is always seen as a necessary evil as a sad occasion because of all the implications it has of, of being far from home, from family, of being severed from friends and, uh, and um, the cultural conversation of the capital. So, yeah, that's the general topic of the poem. Mm. It has an element of descriptive landscape. So, so uh, we should explain the Jingling Ferry Crossing is in modern-day Jiangsu. This is a province in the east of China, and it was pretty close to what had been the capital of the Southern Dynasties, and which would become a capital later again, Nanjing. Nanjing, we mentioned earlier, uh, during the period of the Sixth Dynasties, was called Jiankang. It was destroyed in the unification by the, the, the by, by the emperors of the Shui dynasty. It was later rebuilt under the Tang, although with a different name. So, so this ferry crossing is relatively close to that area of the old capital in Yangsu, where we know that Zhang Hu retired and spent his time in his old age. So he is crossing the ferry, and uh, opposite uh, the ferry, in the other side of the river, uh, is uh, Guazhou. I, I think Guazhou. Is it, it was an, a relatively important hub of commerce during the time, not as important as uh, Yangzhou, which is pretty close as well. But it was, you know, in, in that place where the Jiangzi River merges with, um, with, the gra with the Great Canal. So part of the main artery, the main highway of communication and movement in Tang Imperial China. So, uh, there is a slight element of description of the landscape as well, uh, which almost always happens in travellers' poems, because you know, they're obviously travelling through some place, and they describe it. So, after having said that, let's take a look at the poem, couplet by couplet. First couplet, uh, so you could say the first couplet sets the scene and the mood, and which is already implicit in the title, but it... it it becomes more specific in the first couplet. The second couplet mm, continues the, the story of the first one, really. The, the, you wouldn't be able to say that the first one is objectivist and descriptive and the, first, and the second one is subjective. Mm, both are subjective. There's sadness is included in line two. In fact, in fact, the second couplet seems, in a way, more objectively descriptive than the first one. But... but uh, but well, let's, as I said, let's take a look. First couplet. At Jingling, there is a small inn by the ferry dock. 
A traveller spends the night there, full of sadness. So the first couplet begins with the first line that is purely pictorial. You know, you could very easily imagine a scroll with this. And then in, 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 represent, in pictorial representations of this poem, this sort of scene is very well depicted. So, we're at Jingling. There is a small inn, a rustic building, tiny one, next to the ferry dock. So, without saying anything, we already know that we're probably talking about travelling here. We already know that from the title, but if we hadn't read the title, we would know that, okay, this is a travelling poem. We're in Jingling, there is an inn where a traveller would, um, would find refuge, and there is a ferry crossing that probably the poetic persona wants to cross. Second line, that is made explicit for us. A traveller spends the night there, full of sadness. So, again, the full of sadness is, this is almost unnecessary because we know from the conventions that the traveller is going to be full of sadness, but, you know, the poem really hammers in that idea. In the small, tiny inn, the traveller is spending the night, he is full of sadness, so probably he won't be able to sleep. Why is he sad? Again, there could be many subjective reasons, but travelling in itself is a sad occasion for the scholar official. Now, we might imagine the second couplet would delve, would deepen into these feelings of sadness. It does so obliquely, really. The second couplet mm, implicitly tells us that the poet has been awake all night and tells us the sights that he has seen. And also, the way in which the sights are described indirectly furthers that idea that the poet has been sleepless, has not been able to sleep. So, second couplet. When the tide turns under a setting moon, in the distance, two or three lights flicker at Guizhou. So we have three elements that build up towards the last and essential image of the second couplet, which are those two or three lights flickering at Guizhou. We might, we, we might imagine they are probably city lights. Mm, probably it's dawn. Um, so, so we left in the first couplet with the poet spending the night full of sadness. And the third line gives us three visual but also temporal images. There's when the tide turns under a setting, setting moon. So the tide is turning. We might imagine that that would happen after a few hours probably. Uh, but, but if that is not a clearly enough hmm, or explicit enough time reference, the second image Setting moon tells us, okay, most of the night has been spent and the poet has been awake. He's looking out of the inn. He sees that the tide is turning. Well, probably it's too dark for that, but he might sense that the tide is turning, maybe by the noise it makes or, or under, the, under the moonlight. He's seeing the moon setting, so it's close to dawn. It's probably still dark, but dawn is not far away. So all the night has been spent. And in the distance, we're moving to the fourth line, the poet sees, the poetic persona sees something. What does he see? Two or three lights flickering at Guizhou. As we said, Guizhou was a relatively big city. What are these lights close to dawn? Uh, it's difficult to say. Uh, I don't have enough contextual or background information to know. Mm, could they be fishermen who went out all night with lights in their boats, like cormorant fishing is done like this, but I'm not sure if cormorant fishing is typical in the area of Guizhou. So could they be those points of light over the water that mimic the stars that are probably just about to disappear? Mm -hmm. Could it be the lights of the city? It's close to dawn, so we might imagine fires might be lit up, lights might appear all around the city, which can be seen from this place, not that far away really, from the other point of the river. Anyway, a setting light is followed by a rising light, in a way. These lights flickering at Guizhou. Are the lights meant to convey some symbolic message? Maybe they're a symbol of hope, of, of, of brightness, um, of illumination for the further path on the road that Shan Hu has still to walk? Maybe. Anyway, uh, so to round it up, so this is a, an acceptable poem. I think it's a pretty conventional one. Um, probably it doesn't gain a lot in translation because it's very, very simple and very visual, but it's not, not a bad poem.